can I remind you all that it is only executive lead members present in the room that are taking decisions at this meeting. Those others in attendance are here to provide, provide advice to the executive. The agendas and papers have been published on the council website in advance of the meeting, and there will be an audio recording of the meeting published on the council's website in due course. Uh, today's meeting is being run through a hybrid format, so executive lead members and key officers are physically present here in County Hall. Key officers present uh, include the Director of Finance and the Monitoring Officer, the Chief Executive. Uh, we're expecting online as there is COVID present in the House and that he has appeared looming on the background to, uh, as, uh, as a spectre over us. Um, the meeting is being broadcast and therefore other members of the public and partners can observe the meeting remotely. Um, in terms of the Teams function, please use the meeting chat function only for the purposes of this meeting and primarily that you wish to indicate to speak. I only speak at uh, my invitation and can you please say your name before speaking and can I make ask that cameras and microphones are turned off when they are not necessary. Thank you. Uh, apologies for absence. I have Councillor Adam Dance and uh, Mr Sharkey. Anything further? Nothing further. Thank you. Uh, and declarations of interest. Are there any declarations of interest on the agenda? Not seeing anything and minutes of the meeting held on 10th of May 2023. Uh, this was our fascinating discussion on um, street naming and the equalities audits. Um, are there any amendments to those minutes? Not seeing anything. Do I have a proposer, please? Councillor Lyshon, secondly, Councillor Wyke. Uh, those in favour, please. Those against, that's clearly carried. Public question time. Are there any public questions this morning? No, there are no public questions this morning, which takes us on to item five, which we've got to in two minutes, um, which is adults and health services transformation. And Councillor Ruddle, welcome to your new role, and we're looking forward to hearing all about this. Thank you, thank you, Chair, and thank you very much for letting me introduce this to you. Um, as you, some of you will be aware, it went to scrutiny last week, and they had a really good debate, and I'd like to thank the Chair and the Committee for doing that. I think it was a really good debate we had. Um, it was, I was really pleased that they've um, agreed, uh, they've recommended option two of the report here today. Um, it's, a, it's a transformation programme that we, we do need to put in place to make the necessary savings um, and I will now lead out, hand over to Mel who will take us through the report chair. Thank you very much. Okay. So I don't know if you could share that on the screen please. Brittany um, last week uh, and, and we did have a really good debate there but what I will do here for you today is just run you through uh, what we're looking at, the transformation programme, so that you can come up with uh, the decision of whether to do it in, in which way you would like to do it. And there are three options for you to think through as part of this process. So, I'll start and I'm sure we'll get the presentation up as we go. So, as you're aware, the adult service budget is 186 million and growth each year, year on year, it counts for 38% of the council budget. Uh, what we also know is, and, and uh, having further conversations with uh, with our finance team, we know that part of the precept supports this growth in our budget going on year on year. But what we also know is we have growth, both from a complexity of need, a cost of care, and a demographic growth within within the county of Somerset and actually across the southwest. We need to control some of that growth and improve people's independence so that we can delay that. Now, adult social care on its own cannot do this. It is about how we get support from the rest of the council in terms of supporting our communities and, and having those vibrant, connective communities in Somerset. So on our own, we can't do it all. It's about us as a new council coming together to support each other. Uh, however, if you get people who are more independent, who continue to live in that way, we know that we will save fund money, we have better outcomes for people. Uh, 
the adult growth control target is 10 million in the next two years. And this proposal looks at how we can make those, those targeted savings. If you move on to the next slide, please, on the next, that's next one, please. Thank you. I just wanted to just share with you some of the economic value of social care. I don't think we've pushed this both from an ADAS, from a regional or from a national point of view well enough with our LGA colleagues. But actually, adult social care nationally well, within England contributes to £50.3 billion to our economy year on year. It is huge. It is larger than our construction industry. It is larger than if we looked at our leisure industries with our hospitality together. It is a huge contribution to the economy of England and therefore people locally in Somerset spend their pound within Somerset. There's a lot of work going on. You want to move back? If you move to... It should be on slide three. Yeah, economic value of social care. Down one. Thank you for noting that. Shall I keep going? You're on slide four at the moment. You just want to pop it back one if you can. It's locked. Don't worry, is it locked, does it? You talk quick and catch up. <laughs> I'll talk quick and catch up. That's absolutely <laughs> fine. Let's hope we can move on. So I'll talk quick and catch up. So so in essence, what we're trying to say here is, is there is a lot of work going on uh, both nationally and across the southwest just to make sure everybody is understanding that economic value of social care. I think it's important that we we bring that to light. OK, so let me move on to your slide four, which I'll keep going is around the diagnostics. So the diagnostics that we have had done and, and Newton Europe have come and supported us. For those that don't know Newton Europe and, and don't know uh, them as an organisation, they are one of the leading um, consultancies around the, south, around the country which supports um, adult social care, among other things. And we got them into Somerset really because I wanted to use them as an opportunity to really have a deep dive into us as an, and into adult social care. Nothing they've shared with us isn't something we didn't already know, which is really important for us to note because actually we know ourselves well, but actually we wanted that some that expert eye coming in to see us. So they've, they've looked at three improvement areas. The one that we would always expect is around the um, improvement of our environment and the work within our operations. That is making sure that our staff have the tools to do the right job, the time, the support and the processes. There is working there around efficiencies, around maximising people's independence, around supporting people to have the right tools to do the job, our staff to have the right tools to do the job. The next one is really ensuring we have the right care available in the right place at the right time. This really is around our learning disability services, our mental health services and our physical, uh, our physical disability services. That's about us saying, are we ensuring that people are gaining and progressing to more independent care settings? We know where it works really well, people can live the best life they can live with less support, being more independent, not for all, but for a huge majority of those teams. So there's a lot of work around for each individual to see how we work differently for, with people with a learning disability and have a progressive model of support. And then finally, it's around that optimisation of our intermediate care. We've talked about intermediate care here on many occasions. That's, our, that's how we work with the health to discharge people from hospital. And again, that is our discharge into a reablement services, both supporting people to gain greater independence when they leave hospital, but also developing that capacity to ensure people within the hospitals, within the community, don't end up going into hospitals. And again, there is a massive amount of work that we can do as a system as part of that process. There are some enablers that sit alongside it around workforce, around some of our processes of how we source, some of our right performance management ta da dashboards, some of that uh, financial monitoring and how we do that. And, and finally, some of that digital technology infrastructure that we need to put in place. Now, that part of this is really for us is around um, how we also can add added value about getting, if we do choose to get somebody in like Newton, how that added value supports the rest of the council and what that can bring for us, having an expert organisation who does this on a regular basis across, across other organisations as part of that. So where is that? So what that tells us, and, and, and we've done the diagnostics with them, so what I would say is diagnostics that we've done is bottom up. 
what they've done is worked with our teams to come to this conclusion and then conclu and, and we as a, an organization have signed this off with our finance team you'll see in here that the improvement opportunities are probably in the region of 4.2 million per year each year there is a stretch target in here I'm not going to name that stretch target, even though it's on the slides, because if I do, you'll all say, why haven't you got there? But it is 14.2 million and we're looking for 10. So again, that can only support us going forwards. If you move on to the next slide. Yeah, it's moving. Great. Uh, what you can see in that is, is that within that you can see the deliberate areas. I'm not going to go through each of those. And if we do get Newton to us, and if that's an agreement made today, we would obviously refine this. And the next stages is that real refining of this so that we have a real clear plan with milestones, with targets, and an understanding of how we get to each of those. So you may see the numbers change slightly. The bottom line won't change, but you may see some movement within that. So what are the options that we're taking forward today and asking you to consider? Well, those options we didn't do a do nothing. Lots of people do a do nothing. We didn't put that option in because actually we can't do nothing. And therefore we, we can't continue um, to improve the outcomes for the people of Somerset by doing nothing means that our budget will continue just to rise and rise. So we've looked at three options. The first option is do we just use that diagnostic and now do that in house? Um, I think that's a real challenge for us. I'm not saying that we don't have the skills within the council, but what I am saying with the transformation that's already needing to go on within this council as part of uh, the new Somerset the, uh, and the unitary around that, we are we are sucking most of our resources in to actually deliver that, to deliver that that Somerset, that uh, Somerset new Somerset council. Uh, and actually, I don't think within our adult service, we have the capacity or capability to actually pull this off within the, within our own workforce. So there is that. Uh, we would need to recruit to expand our internal team to do that. Recruitment is really hard. The savings would probably take two to three times longer than we can achieve if we did get somebody in support and support us. And there's no guarantee of that savings. Uh, I think the other part of this is we have spoken to many, many, and if you look at the report itself, many local authorities across the country that either have had Newton to, to continue from diagnosis on to um, delivery and those that haven't. And talking to my colleague Dasis and, our, our, um, and, and we've also talked to your finance leads, uh, we know that where we haven't had them in and we've tried to do it in ourselves, Sometimes they've tried to do it as a system themselves. They've brought them back in to do the diagnostics three or four years later. We've got that evidence within the report, so I won't uh, continue with that. The second option, as I've said, is to pull Newton in. Um, there is a cost to delivering on this, and we know that there's a one-off fee of 3.5 million per year for the next two years. But what does, would that give us? It would have give us a team of between 15 and, and 20 people alongside our adult social care staff. Um, they would deliver an intense focused programme of activity which would, would last 14 to 18 months. They would not leave us. There is a guarantee in their contract that we would develop with them, which is a guarantee of a 10 million of recurring financial benefits as part of this. So that's part of, of the contract and arrangements that we would put in place. Um, and what they also offer is some really good skills transfer as part of this. So they will offer some real training for all of our staff across the council, whether that be a secondment into them to help part of the project to then come out and deliver. Uh, or we could delay the start of this and go out back out to procure another partner to do it. There are other partners out there that could deliver this for you. We could go out and do that. The challenge for us is that would probably take another three to six months. They would do another diagnostic because they wouldn't take on the diagnostics that we had in place here. Uh, it may be a slightly cheaper model, but again, we would have to be looking at contingency fee model for this work going forward. So my recommendation for you to consider is that we pick up uh, number two as part of that process. Could you move the slide again for me, please? Thank That's you. Twice. Go again. Thank you. OK, thanks. So rationale for recommendation, and I've described most of that rationale already for you, but it does fit with your plan that you have in place. Uh, and we will ensure that as part of this, we have real rigour. So we have already been to the 
Transformation, Transition and Change Board, where we've discussed this extensively. We've looked at the governance that would sit around it if we did choose to, ha to, to use U Newton today. And that governance would go to that Transformation Board. It would also uh, go to uh, our health system because there is a part for us here from, from health as well as social care. So we would do that. We would have to mobilise pretty quickly and they would be able to do that. We would be tracking the benefits and financial impact both through that transformation board and through the MTFP board as part of this process. Scrutiny recommended and, and their recommendation that they have added was that we could go back to scrutiny on a, on a regular basis to report, which again seems a reasonable ask. And again, we could bring that back to, to execs when and if needed. So I think that is a process that we would put in place. I've, would you like to move on to the next slide, please? I've been asked about the contingency modelling so that you start to understand that. There is a contingency modelling in here. We have already looked at a contract arrangement in the background and we've been working with our legal team to ensure that that contract arrangement is, is correct. It is absolutely clear that it's about contingency fee model. And you can see here just how we'd look at that contingency fee model taking place. If you move on to the next stage. Uh, governance, I've really already discussed with you about how we're going to do that and the reporting mechanisms within that. I'll finish at that point and ask if there are any questions for anybody. Oh, that's better. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Mel. Thank you for, the, for, for that explanation. Um, just looking around the room, I've got one question and I see Ros. Wike's got one, so I'll take Ros first. OK, thank you very much indeed, Mel, and um, it's looking promising and I appreciate there will be a reporting mechanism. The one thing I always feel with um, taking on board consultants, and I know it's within the paper, that um, there's going to be a transfer of learning um, because the skills which they bring to uh, adult um, services no doubt can be transferred and so I would love to know how we're going to formally um, record and report back on the learning because that is is a, a real bonus to any professional uh, consultancy we take on board. So we've talked through with with Newton already and, and talking to my colleagues in other organisations that have had them in what they bring is that, so what we have to ensure is at the beginning of this process that we make sure our finance team are sitting alongside them and saying, actually, this is how you measure. This is what it looks like. Now, does that then enable us to say, actually, how are we doing this in Somerset for other services? What does that look like? Our performance team will sit alongside them very early on so that we are sharing the right performance tools that we use. That can then go and influence the rest of the, the local authority if the, if we need that to the next of the council. The other part of that is as part of the transformation board, we will be sharing the learning there. So how is this happening? The transferation of transferring of skills, what their offer also is, is to use some of the change team that we'll be supporting internally to sit alongside them during this process, to second over to them in essence during this process, so that again they can work that through. The formal leadership development again is a part of what they do and they do offer that formal leadership development wider and they would offer that as part of this process wider to the rest of the, the authority again we need to nail that we need to understand how that would help us and use that in that way thank you that's really reassuring um perhaps in the months to come um uh, Councillor Buck Phillips could actually report back on how that transformation skills are being transferred and how how we can learn from them and because and, I think having a third party in the room on that would be I think helpful and give some rigor to that transfer. Thank you very much. Um, yes, very happy to do that. And I think we'd welcome that, and I think they they would they would uh, be very supportive of that. So not a problem. Uh, thank you. Um, my question is um, in relation to uh, paragraph nine, section two. And it's the second sentence. I love the first six words because it said the projected savings would be guaranteed. And it's the second seven words I'd just like you to, to, to expand on, which uh, says using a 100% contingent commercial fee model. And I don't know what one of them is. is. So could you explain that to me, please? Sure, I can. Uh, so, so, so the where I will start is is what it basically says is they want two things. One, 
they won't leave us until they, they've secured that, that 10 million from us. That's a guarantee that they give to us as part of this process. The contingency model is actually, if between us all we're saying, look, this isn't working, we wouldn't pay them the amount. There's a contingency sliding scale about actually how much you pay them depends how much they, um, they achieve. So you only pay on achieving the amount of money that we need to, we, that we, they need to achieve from us. So it's welcome to Newton, they'll never leave? Or... They will leave. <laughs> they will leave because we will succeed here. So my expectation is they're with us. They've transferred the skills. They may well be with us for 15 to 18 months. That's, that's the reality of where we are. Uh, if they take the system piece of work up as well, they will. Um, so if they, they're going to help us with, with the system. So if that happens, they may be with us a system a little longer. And when I say system, I mean our health and, our health and social care system. Thank you for that reassurance. Councillor Lysham. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I just wanted to make a point about risk sharing on, on this model. It's uh, the, the slide that actually gives that, that model. Um, it's really clever and is actually extremely familiar to me. If you have a look at how box office deals are done in theatre, this is a very familiar model. It also works in cinema and and that risk sharing approach, along with some other factors, is what gives me my support for this today. Um, and the other points are that transformation doesn't drive itself. It has to be driven. If we had the people in house, as Mel has indicated, we don't have enough people in house to drive this form of transformation. If we had them, they drive the transformation and then move on. So it makes sense for a big organisation to pull in those skills, use those skills, leave behind the legacy of the learning. And then, of course, they move on to another organisation. They won't move on to another organisation unless they succeed in the work they're doing at this council and have done at other councils. So I can understand that there will be concerns about the finances here. I just wanted to make the point, Chair, that I support this decision today for those reasons. Thank you. I'm not sure that needs a response, but thank you for that reassurance on that. I'm not seeing anything else from League members or associate league members. Oh, sorry, Councillor Wakefield. Say something in the report about other councils. Well, I just wondered if um, Mel could just highlight what other councils have done and how successful it's been, because it, we need to know that this works and it would be helpful for members to know that. Certainly. So uh, talking to my colleagues across the country, what I know is it is not an easy process. So when, a, when a, the consultancy will come in, they will test us. They will make sure that we are fully involved with this. But actually, they will be making that change at speed. So my DAS is around the country that have helped and said, hold your hat, Mel. This is going to be a tough couple of months at least while we're settling in. And it'll be even tougher because they will want to churn the change really quickly. So make sure you're there and on board with that. We can see from uh, other organisations, so the likes of um, Leicestershire, the likes of Essex and others, that they have made the same that they said at the beginning of that process. We have independently gone to those organisations and asked them and have had reports back from those organisations to tell us. Where people haven't had them to continue on to that piece of work, we can also see, talking to the DASs and others, that they weren't able to make that saving. Or if they did, it took them four or five years longer to be able to deliver that. We haven't got the time for that within Somerset. So there is absolute evidence in there, evidence that we have collated both from a financial perspective and from, from uh, our colleagues and, and writing to us with absolutely this word and sharing that information with us. And actually it's, it's a similar model they've used in other areas. The savings that they propose to achieve here and that we can achieve together are things that they're looking at across the country. So it's a model that, that, that does work across the country. Thank you. Um, I can see Councillor Osborne, who's the opposition spokesman online. Is it OK? I'll go to her first, Mandy. Uh, Sue, do you want to come in? Um, yes, please. Thank you. Um, apologies, I'm sort of not on screen um, because the broadband here is terrible and I'm also sitting in a car because I in a courtesy car because I've just got back from taking car in for MOT and keeping it legal. Um, Certainly, if we were in opposition, if we were still in power, which we're not, 
um, we would have been having to do a similar exercise in terms of managing this budget and looking at how we're doing things. So I wish you well. I support the programme. I wish you well um, and hope it delivers everything that it says on the tin. However, I do have a couple of questions. The first one is, how confident are you that there is sufficient capacity in the voluntary sector because there's a lot of emphasis on using community and that would obviously infer voluntary and that that is a sufficient capacity across the county to deliver what you want to do and meet your ambitions and my second question relates to legal advice and in terms of what legal advice and legal reassurance you have got um, in terms of the risk of legal challenge, um, particularly when you are having to make some of the decisions that are indicated in here, such as moving people from residential back into community or altering people's care packages. Um, thank you, but I wish you well with the programme. Okay, let's... Uh, thank you for your good wishes, Mel. Oh, thank you, sorry. Uh, let's, let's take the first one first then. So, so... Uh, in terms of uh, voluntary sector, we are already using the voluntary sector extensively to support us within adult social care. As the LCNs develop and continue to develop, that, can, that only improves. So it is about the whole way in which this council is working and, and it is around how do we link into our communities, how do we make our communities thrive. So that will support adult social care going forward. It is inevitable that that happens as part of that process. In terms of legal advice, uh, we probably don't need to use legal advice. Uh, our Care Act assessments clearly tell us how we can and can't work with individuals. So we, if, if somebody is moving from one property to another, it's a conversation we had earlier on today. If somebody is moving from one property to another, perhaps a person with a learning, learning moving from a residential setting to a supported living setting, which is probably more progressive for them and a different way of working. We would work with that individual if that individual didn't have capacity. We would work with their families and we would use what we would call a best interest decision to support the, the move from one place to another. That's part of the work that our social workers, it's bread and butter for our social workers. If we felt we needed legal support, we use our legal teams here within Somerset regularly to have some of those conversations. We would also, if necessary, and if there was huge disagreement, use the court process as we would now. So it's nothing that we're not used to doing. I don't expect this to be something, it is better, as long as what we're doing is better for individuals, it's about how you work with them to secure that progressive support. Yeah, thank you very much for your response, Mel. But I felt it was, you know, whilst I'm you know, aware of, of the responses, it is helpful perhaps for those responses to be on record um, should any queries arise. But as I say, I do wish you well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sue. And I wish you well with your with your car MOT as well. Um, so I. <laughs> uh, and I'm just looking around the room. I see Mandy's already at the chair. So let's go with Mandy first. Trying to save you a few minutes, Chair, so creeping here. So thank you. I have four uh, questions, but first to say I'm reading the report, lots of this didn't feel new. And, uh, you know, much of this work has been sort of going on in different areas anyway. And just to raise for me a concern, you have got areas of the county, Minehead, that I represent included, where you've got a huge amount of elderly people already. So it's getting the infrastructure in place to support in areas what is 50, uh, up to 50 percent over 65s already. So I think that will be a challenge. So my questions one by one all together, Chair. How many did you say? Four. Four. Let's do one by one. Lovely. Thank you very much. So in order to meet the savings target within this year's budget that relates to the Newton Europe Diagnostic Review work, is there a risk that 200,000 fewer hours of home care for some will be a cut in service that could detrimentally impact the lives of Somerset's most vulnerable residents? OK, so reality, and, and we all knew that as we were talking this through, making all of those savings in year, we won't do. What we will be doing is, is making those within the in the first two years. I think that's something that we were absolutely clear about. A reduction of hours. Let me help describe how that happens. So what we do at the moment is we have a reablement service, and our reablement services supports a reduction of about eight hours per person per week, a good, going on to needing a long term uh, home care. What this model is based on is what what works in in good systems. 
and very good systems. Hence, you get a stretch and a non-stretch. So good systems between eight and nine hours per week reduction once you're working with somebody in a really good reablement way. So therefore, you do not need the majority of the home care that you will need going forward. So that's where your reduction comes from. It's not going to happen overnight. It means we work with the system to do that and to work with individuals. We also have alongside this our strategy for um, technology and how we continue to lose technology. We're starting to use that a lot better in some that we need to continue to do that from a health and social care system. So what this is, is about helping us to ensure that with new demand coming into the service, that we level that off, that we support people as long as possible to be as um, able as possible with the right support going in, both from our health community and ourselves. Thank you. And I think it's always worth bearing in mind that even at home with all the support in the world, there is still a deterioration as people get older. So that support might need to go back up again. So the equalities impact assessment on thir page 36, I was just surprised to read it, said there's no impact assessment required as there's no reduction of an existing service. Given there'll be 200,000 fewer hours commission and a change in service for some, is this correct? So what we've agreed to do as part of this process is as we take every step during it, we will continue to do impact assessments. It's really difficult to do an impact assessment on a diagnostic. So what we want to really do and, and working with, with Trudy and, and, her, and their team within that, that part of the service, we've sat down and said, right, so every impact that we have, we will have a constant process of, of um, a quality impact assessment every time we think that you know, this is involved, this isn't, and uh, their team will be supporting us with that. Thank you. I'd really have welcomed that sort of commentary with the impact assessment to acknowledge that there will be a change for some and there will be an intact, uh, impact and change perhaps in that service delivery for some, even if you haven't got the answers. Would it be nice to see that acknowledged within the impact assessment? So my next question, which earmark reserve will be used to fund the £7 million pounds of cost to engage Newton Europe uh, as the strategic change partner to deliver the identified uh, reductions. At this point, I'm going to hand swiftly over to <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Vaughan. Oh, sorry, Mr Vaughan. Oh, I'm just demoting you, sorry. Uh, Thanks. <laughs> Mr Vaughan has, uh, has just, uh, to, just reached for the microphone. <laughs> I, I thought I was going to be able to vote then for a second. I was getting all excited. Um, yeah, so it, it, in terms of the uh, cost of getting there, the once-off cost, the £7 million pounds you'll see in the report is split into uh, £3.5 million and another 3.5 million. Um, 3.5 million for the costs in the current financial year will be funded from the social care volatility reserve that has a balance of 4.4 million pounds on it. And as I said in the report, we are reviewing all of the reserves once we've completed the close down of all five councils accounts. We will then be bringing a report to the executive setting out how we bring all those reserves together and reallocate them because there will be need to do that as we're one organization rather than five separate ones that's likely to be by september that we would do that and we will then uh, take into account how we fund the 3.5 for 24 25 as part of that work that's part touched on my next question. Um, so page 32, given the cost reductions are different to those built into the MTFP in February, it says that the 4.8 million of in-year extra pressures in 23-24 will be drawn from the social care volatility reserve. So I'll just ask you to confirm that figure, check I heard it right. How much is in this reserve both before and after the draw on it? There's also within the report to be a review of reserves undertaken, which we're all aware of. But as there's no breakdown of reserves in the budget this February, could I be provided with a breakdown of the current reserves position, please? Let's start with the last bit first. So in the February report that went to Council, the Council approved, there was a breakdown between general reserves, which were 47.4, he said off the top of his head. I think it was 0.4 and the balance that was in earmarked reserves just over totaling 112 million pounds. Um, there is a spreadsheet with all of those reserves on that goes to about 400 lines. You're welcome to have that if you really want it. Um, 
so I'll ha happily share that with you. Uh, but the piece of work we're doing over the summer is to bring that together. There is quite a lot of detail in there to bring those into actually a, a more sensible reserve. So to make that kind of real for people, each of the individual uh, councils would have held something on something like business rates, volatility to cover those types of things for appeals and timing issues around business rates. As one council, you wouldn't hold five separate business rates reserves. You bring them into one. So that's the work we will be doing over the summer. Sorry, just the bit of the question, you might have missed it. How much you're saying is 4.8, it's going to come from social care volatility reserve. What was the sort of before and after balance? Just to get an idea of how much is in there, Jason. Thank you. So so in, in terms of how, you know, it, when we set the budget back in February, um, we put in uh, £33 million of extra growth into the social care budget. That was reduced down to £28 million because there was an assumption that we would deliver £5 million from this work. So the assumption is that we would deliver £10 million in total, £5 million this year and £5 million in 24-25. Now that the work's been done, you'll see the total actually exceeds £10 million, it's £10.4 before you take into account the stretch. The timing of that is different. So at the moment, we have an issue that we've built £5 million into the budget Based on this work, if you look at the figures, we're either only going to achieve 0 0.2 or if you look at the stretch target, 0 0.7. So there's a shortfall. So the initial approach will be what we'll be saying to the service, can you cover that? And you know, Mel and her colleagues will work on that during this year. The second pot of money you would look to then is the corporate contingency. We hold £6 million in the corporate contingency. But there are other calls on that, such as the national pay award, I think is likely to be more than what we budgeted for. And then the final call will be reserves. So we will pick all of that up over the work we're doing over the summer to set that out. Sorry, just to pick up the point, and this is why I've I've asked the question. Within the report, it says it will be the 4.8 in year will come from the social care volatility reserve, but you're saying something tentatively different to that. OK, thank you very much, Chair, for your indulgence. You're very welcome, Mandy. Um, David, good morning. Um, so a couple of questions from me, if I may. Um, first of all, congratulate uh, Dean on uh, his uh, elevation to the executive and look forward to working with him. I've already offered within my LJ role to uh, to share any information and uh, work alongside as much as possible. Uh, I'd be very interested in Dean's view in terms of the um, his confidence in the savings that have been outlined um, and the delivery of those savings. So that's my first question. And the second one is, as we use in so much the volatility, volatility reserve fund, I'm concerned that we're not going to be able to invest into staff wages. Um, and we were particularly proud of uplifting um, employees, care employees, wages um, up to the living wage. And that made quite an impact upon um, turnover and morale and service. And I just want to make sure that we're not undermining the opportunity to do that going forward. Shall I do the second one first for you? So, so we already within this budget, as you're fully aware, put 24.9 million into our care sector this year as part of that process. We absolutely are not uh, taking any of that out of this base. We have the cost of care uh, exercise that we required, and in the in the next year's budget again, there is money in there to uplift our providers, which ultimately uplifts the pay for those individuals. So that's part of that process. That isn't to do in this part of the process. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you for your question. Yes, obviously, I'm, I've, I've had a, a look at this and initially, yes, um, I had a few queries and Mel's answered those queries and I've, I've had a really good look at it. And actually, yes, I am confident now that actually we can make these savings um, and, and we need to make these savings. Thank you. OK, just looking around the room for any more questions and online. I've got Liz Lyshon would like to come back from the member. OK, thank, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to make the point that Scrutiny made a, a good point about strategic risk and where it sits on the new council's risk register. Uh, and I hope that we'll be carrying that forward because we clearly need to. Thank you. 
just just to confirm that's already done we've we've already done that following scrutiny so thank you for that thank you asked and answered um don't just looking to see whether the scrutiny chair is on line i can't see her um with any other um, any other comments um, I thought, do, do dean rodler is making swimming motions oh she's on a holiday <laughs> oh <laughs> um, I, I was I was I was slightly concerned um, um, in so many ways. Um, um, I, have we covered all the recommendations from scrutiny within within this? Mel is assuring me that we have, and I think uh, um, commentary has been that that has been taken into account fully. Uh, are there any other more points in the room, online or back from lead members or associate lead members? In which case, can I draw members' attention to the recommendation? Which is that the aims and objectives of the next phase of the transformation program um, is agreed um, to engage Newton Europe as a strategic change partner to work alongside the service to deliver these transformational objectives and to fund the transformation program of 3.5 million each year for the next two years initially from earmark reserves and review the position later in the financial year once the 22-23 statement of accounts from predecessor councils has been completed. I'm looking for a proposer on those recommendations and Councillor Ruddle has won that race and Councillor Lyshon is seconding. Can I see those lead members in favour please? Those against, that's clearly carried. Thank you. Which brings us on to item six on the agenda, which is the adoption of the Somerset Tree Strategy. And um, Councillor Dyke. Thank Good you. Good morning, Sarah. Thank you, Chair. Um, one of the um, key priorities of this uh, council is to create a greener, more sustainable Somerset. Um, so I'm really delighted to uh, be presenting the Somerset Tree Strategy to you today. Um, it recognises the council's role in helping um, the twin crises of the climate change and biodiversity loss. And the strategy is a combination of 10 months work in partnership with a huge number of stakeholders from across Somerset. The strategy has been developed with members from the Somerset Local Nature Partnership um, with funding kindly provided by Exmoor National Park, the Forestry Commission, the Woodland Trust, the Environment Agency, Local Nature Ship Partnership and the Quantock Hills AOMB uh, alongside the previous five Somerset councils. Um, we've tried to be as open as possible with input into this strategy and um, with a public consultation run between October and November last year for six weeks on what people wanted to see in the tree strategy. And this was followed by a consultation in January 2023 on the final draft of the strategy. It was then presented to the Policy Environment Scrutiny Committee in March 2023 and with their feedback incorporated into the final documents uh, before you today. It was also requested that a progress um, report against the actions should be reported to the group every six months, um, which, of course, we are more than happy to do. So the strategy consists of three documents, the first being the strategy uh, itself, um, a short, succinct 18 page document designed to be read in five to 10 minutes by anyone, uh, whether they are an expert in trees or not. Uh, because we really wanted to um, have it easily digestible and, uh, and set out clearly how uh, treescapes um, are uh, in Somerset and where we want to get to. It also sets the strategy into four, five sorry, core themes around creating a woodland culture, making our treescapes more resilient and adaptable to climate change, expanding tree coverage across Somerset, focusing on the services and products around trees and creating a sustainable and flexible governance structure. The second document, our objectives and actions document, takes these five core themes and breaks them down into actions for delivery. So again, this is designed to be a short and succinct document that is easily readable and understandable in a short amount of time. And finally, the third document is just over uh, 50 pages, and that's what we're calling our evidence document, which goes into much more detail around the strategy. Um, there, this is for those that really want to get in um, underneath the skin of the document and obviously the information around the current climate background and data that's talked about within the strategy. 
And finally, we have also been successful in receiving funding from the Forestry Commission to employ three dedicated officers who will be responsible for the delivery of this strategy, two of which are due to start at the end of these um, months. And these three roles are absolutely pivotal um, to reach our targets and ambitions uh, and, um, and make sure they are met and aligned to the local nature recovery strategy. So it's a case of right tree, right place. So we've got a, a project officer who will be responsible for the project management and delivery of the strategy, a community empowerment officer who will engage and work with communities across Somerset, and a technical officer who will provide the technical expertise to both the internal and external stakeholders. So I want to, um, before I hand over to, to Jacob, I want to pass on a massive thank you um, to him because he has done an absolutely extraordinary job on bringing this um, report together. And obviously the other members of the team that have participated, um, obviously before we um, unified to one council, um, there was a, a number of teams that were involved from all the district councils. Um, you've worked extremely hard to bring this together and everybody's con contributed to delivering um, what I believe is a strong strategy, a fluid strategy, um, that we are looking um, to take forward into delivery and really excited to be able to be at this stage to get it um, into the delivery stage. So I would ask that the executive to approve the recommendations that are set out in the papers, but obviously happy to take any questions, but I think Jacob would like to um, put some more um, information on this together. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to attempt to try and show a video um, that we've had produced alongside the strategy. So uh, bear with me two seconds. Hopefully everyone can hear this. Just imagine Somerset without any trees. We have a rich history of trees in our landscapes, but our woodland cover is below the national average. Increasing storms and threats of diseases are real concerns for the trees that we have. We needed a strategy that helps us help our trees, one that embraces ecology, climate and community. Our communities and us as individuals need to notice trees more, think about how they impact our day-to-day -day life, not just in their beauty, but in the way they help stem floodwaters coming onto the levels, how they create wildlife corridors or contribute to a new generation of low carbon homes. Over the next decade, we will make sure that the woodlands that we have are resilient, adaptable and well managed. We'll create a diverse treescape that connects our rural woodlands to our urban trees. If we all care more, we can make change happen. It does flow a little bit smoother than that, I promise. Um, I'll put the link in the chat for everybody, but uh, yes, happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you very much. Um, can I just, just echo Sarah's thanks? So, so it, was, it was one of those reports that's actually a genuinely fascinating read, and I always love a good map, and some of the maps in this were really fascinating to look at and, 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 and get under the skin of, of what we've got here. Um, I see Councillor White first, thank you. Thank you. The strategy as we see it today, as it stands, is interesting, it's worthwhile, and I think um, plays to, I think, most of our concerns. I, I have just one real underlying concern, that this shouldn't be a standalone strategy. It has to be part of a suite of strategies around land usage, around planning, and the other um, drivers of our of our manifesto, our plan and whatever. And therefore to have one in isolation, and I know it's high level, and I know it alludes to the fact that it's going to be working with others in terms of planning and in terms of land use, but to have one without seeing the others around, I think could come back and bite us in lots of different ways. I understand the need and the drive to move forward on this, and with speed because we do need to address some trees in Somerset and I, no way do I disagree with that but I do have concerns that we should be looking at it in terms of a suite of strategies rather than just one on its own and therefore can I can I suggest that 
when we look at it again in six months time when the report comes that we will have some other strategies around land use and some of the planning issues because otherwise we will quite rightly um, raise our involvement, raise expectations and move things forward, hopefully at pace, which is what we need to do for the trees of Somerset. But on the other hand, we can't exclude the responsibility for effective use of land within Somerset and also some of the planning, some of the travel issues and whatever we need to add to this, add to the overall uh, view. It's got to be holistic. It can't just be um, a tree strategy in isolation. Sarah, did you want to come back on that? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, Councillor White, I completely understand um, what you say, and I think your question would be exactly my answer to, to, to that, that we do need to, to work holistically, we do need to work at pace, and obviously the teams are working exceptionally hard to make sure that all our strategies are aligned, and uh, as I've said in my introduction, that this will come back. It's a fluid document. It will sit and align with other documents as they are developed um, in the course of time, but uh, obviously Jacob has worked extremely hard on this to, to ensure that we are there. It was one of our key manifesto pledges um, around planting more trees in the county, but I, I feel very strongly um, that a land use strategy is, is next on our list and, and must be part of um, that bigger picture. Uh, uh, absolutely, and it goes into the whole strategic planning process, which, um, which we will be something that we, we, we all know is on the horizon with various states of inherited local plans from our predecessor councils. Um, Councillor Dixie, thank you. It's Dutch, but Dixie's fine. Thank you, thank you, oh, Chair. Well, I quite like being Councillor Bill as well, but there you go. <laughs> Um, uh, okay, um, in, interesting, just picking up on that last point, I, I think my question to Jacob would be, um, Jacob, I know you've been involved in the, um, the local energy plan, which is kind of taking place, which is a land mapping exercise. I'm hoping in the Venn diagram you're sitting in the, in the middle as a person with both camps. Is there a kind of, you know, is, is there an overlay? That would, that would be my, my question. But my... Um, comments are that I really welcome this document. I, I like the way it's structured in that the quick read, the longer read and the read for tree geeks, because because I think often when we put really detailed documents out there in the public domain, people just get switched off because they don't want to read, you know, 100 pages. And um, I think that there's an awful lot of tree planting has gone on in a, a reaction to um, climate change and ecological threat there's and there are little groups doing stuff all over the place and what this does is help join up the dots and and in a way just plonking a tree in the ground is not the way to go and i think what's really interesting about this how this strategy came about is that it came about through a failed funding bid for, for tree planting which we thought was you know not a success and actually it's allowed us to stand back and think carefully look at the big picture look at the future and it's not just about trees it's factored in people as well and that's that's people and all of those other needs and that's the whole cultural bit is is really really um important it's about looking after our existing trees which sometimes gets forgotten in the race to plant new trees and if we don't look after them they're not going to um survive and it's also a great example of partnership working and i think I know Sarah would agree we in terms of climate change, we can't do anything on our own, really. It is all about um, partnership working. And the last thing I want to say, if Councillor Cavill is listening, he will be um, eager to know that the Somerset Wood, you know, is known about, acknowledged and, you know, part of this picture. And Jacob is fully aware of that. It's a great, a great project and it's not forgotten. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dodge. Thank you. Um, so in terms of mapping overlaying with the energy plan, absolutely. So um, and coming back to that kind of suite of policies, so local nature recovery strategy, biodiversity net gain, land use, which I think is our, our favourite topic at the moment and management of that. So, yeah, absolutely. We'll be looking at overlays, what can and can't go where. So, yeah, that'll definitely be part of it. Um, and then just to echo management of trees, maintenance of trees is equally, if not more important. So very much a part of this strategy. 
Um, and yes, Somerset Wood learned all about it. Very, very interesting. So we'll make sure that we include that as well. Uh, thank you. We've got Councillor Rigby next and Councillor Mund. Mike, good morning. Morning. Thank you, Phil. Um, I think this is a great strategy, some really good work here, and it, it's very timely. As the strategy notes, we are well below the national average, and our national average, frankly, isn't great when you've got countries like France and Spain at close to 30%, which is twice what our target is in this UK. So I think it's really important that we do press on with this. Um, I've personally planted thousands of trees myself uh, and been responsible for planting hundreds of thousands more. Um, it, and it, it's it's really important that we provide, I think, a, a framework for people to go about doing this work. Um, we've got some real threats at the moment. Um, I never think there's enough Latin spoken in these meetings, so I will refer to Phytophthora remorum being a big threat to the larch and uh, Hymenocyphus fraxineus being a big threat to our um, ash tree population. And, you know, when we hear that ash trees are a, a massive part of our, our tree population and when you you think that 97 percent of them are forecast to die that's horrific frankly you know some of our biggest trees around uh, so this strategy is really timely to help us combat these sorts of issues and to make sure that what goes what comes next in terms of replanting uh, is is the right thing thank you thank you i'm always always delighted to hear more latin spoken and uh, maybe we'll have an intervention from jacob rees mogg one day who knows um uh, Tessa. Thank you. Um, I probably should have brought this up before, and I did think about it the last time we were sitting over there, and then it went out of my head. But I wonder whether it might be a good idea for us to work with you and for you to work with us to make sure that we have some sort of children and young people strategy, because there are a number of kids who go to forest school. We should be teaching and actively presenting what happens um, what trees and everything else mean in our county to young people in school and that can work so well across those young people who are perhaps more challenged in the way that they're educated so there's also there's the jobs and and the strategy needs to look at jobs and various things you know the careers that are available and which will become increasingly available um, so I'd really welcome that as a first point um, and I think the second thing is we we could probably I could probably ask you to consider, please, Sarah, um, that we create a children and young people's version of this, if you like, something that's possibly more accessible, um, but very presentable into every school in this county, because we have to take this seriously. And, you know, it's us that's messed it up and the kids are going to have to sort it out. Um, the other completely disconnected point that I would actually have just thought about and I cannot remember at all where I saw it but in the last 48 hours I have seen a report somewhere of the fact that our developers housing developers have allowed I believe I'm right in saying something like 80 or 90 maybe it's only 60 only 60 trees to die on a second a replacement planting where they just plant trees and go, that's fine, walk away. Everybody knows you have to mulch. Everybody knows you have to water for the first two or three years. The tree's particularly delicate. You know, well, I think everybody knows that, except the developers. And so I think we need to be very, very rigorous. And I'd ask you to take a particular interest in when we're creating our local plan and looking at all of our neighbourhood planning for um, tree to, for tree strategy to be active in that what we do is we somehow um, ask developers to not just build, plant, and walk away. They need to have they need to be held into a ten year commitment to make sure that they replace any tree. And they don't seem to care about the fact that trees die. They just come along and spend squillions of pounds replacing them and walk away again and it's not good enough and we need to somehow as this council we can take trees seriously it's every tree and it's every tree on streets in parks in you know locations that are attached to developments and others thank you chair thank you jacob it's a really did you want to, piece of work did you jacob do you want to respond to those points yeah, happy to. I think the overlap with children and young people would be great. I mean, there's plenty of reference in the strategy about that. So, yeah, and I love the idea of creating a, a young people's version. That was the idea behind the film was that accessibility. So, yeah, I think that'd be a brilliant idea. Um, and then just to completely agree with local plan development. And, and we had planning colleagues involved with the development of the strategy and how we kind of interweave it as 
we develop the new local plan and, and potential, you know, other SPDs, DPDs, that kind of thing. So yeah, absolutely agree with that as well. Okay, and Councillor Wakefield. Um, yes, I just wanted to um, echo something that Mike said about trees dying, which is something that worries me terribly, particularly the ashes that you can see everywhere. Um, are we sort of fighting against the tide here? Because there are going to be a lot of tree deaths and tree removals. And is there something in the strategy about replacing those, you know, in, in situ or somewhere else? And my second point is about farmers ploughing up to the bottom of trees, particularly we've got some very old oaks in this county, certainly in my parish we have, and they just plough right up to the bottom of them and they are dying and they are seven or eight hundred years old and it's just not good enough. They need to know that they shouldn't be doing that. And I don't know whether that's part of this or not. Uh, so in terms of fighting it's the time, I mean, yes, we, we are all very aware of kind of the amount of ash trees and, and, and the protection and, and the amount that we're going to lose. So I think it's difficult, but I think there's a lot of work already going on. And part of this strategy is about bringing that together and understanding what's going on as well. So Somerset Wood was something that I wasn't aware of until the strategy kind of came together. So this is about understanding what's going on and what we can replicate and networking and all that kind of thing as well. Um, apologies, do you mind repeating your second question? It was about farmers ploughing up to trees. So yeah, so around wood culture, definitely, and around woodland management is something. And again, there's a, a piece of work beyond this about the communication of the strategy and, and what what you know what people can do and, and work together on. So yeah, absolutely, definitely part of it. Okay, councillors, why can month both of us come back in? But can I ask you both to be brief? Thank you. Yes, the quick comment about developers walking away. Um, the, the, planning law at the moment is that if you have a landscaping condition it's only legally binding for five years and therefore what we're going to have to do in the new local plan is actually change the way we actually put conditions which take beyond the statutory limits um, it can be done through 106s and various other things but um, it's not a just a straightforward thing it doesn't mean to say we shouldn't be doing it and we will be doing it but it's it's going to be difficult. OK. Briefly, please. Yes, it will be. Just going to say, I wonder whether there's a place for Jacob, perhaps, uh, in conjunction with Theo and Val, to actually look at informing communities about what needs to be done when we plant trees through the LCN networks, and whether that's, if, if people know that you can't plough up to the bottom of a tree and expect it to survive, or that you need to do this and you need to do that. I think it might be quite helpful. And we've got that we've got that structure in place now where we can in a you know a relatively, I don't know, 17 or 18 ways, um, actually put that information out there. Thank you. Um, briefly, Councillor Dyke, like please. Yeah, uh, really LCNs, absolutely. Um, we are working up a, a programme to go into the LCNs to ensure that they are very briefed. I hope there's going to be an environment champion within each of the LCNs um, to date that, that kind of work forward. Uh, and just regarding Sarah's point, um, our technical officer that obviously is going to be recruited as part of this work is going to be key um, to making sure that um, our farmers and landowners are, are managing the land and the trees around them absolutely appropriately. So we're engaging with all of those wider stakeholders thank you just moving on to look around the room uh mandy first please uh, i'm happy for you to take whichever turn you like thank you very much um i've got a few so i go through one by one again wonderful okay um, so I'm just wondering as well, um, in terms of um, the comparison and achievable limits, given that we've got um, A, O and Bs in Somerset and a lot more land and space, should we be looking at having a higher achievable limit than elsewhere in the country? Uh, so I think that comes back to the land management side and the right tree right pay principle. So when we've you've got the map of kind of tree cover ward by ward as well, and some are well above the kind of 13% national average, some are well below. Obviously, there are some places that aren't suitable and others. I know the A, O and Bs, obviously, Mendip Hills, I know particularly well, Ash dieback is a huge issue. So I think, yes, there will be other areas that will need to be higher to compensate those are lower, but I think it comes back to that, that land management of there's no point sticking trees on beautiful meadows and things like that as well, so yeah. Okay, wonderful. Um, and in terms of maps as well, I know that from uh, the tree strategy, the evidence used in it, the map uh, was from 2018. Did figures and more recent figures than that? 
uh, the, there will be an update in 2023 and they're going to be so the NFI, the National Forest Inventory we've got in there only goes down to um, half a hectare. And the new mapping that's going to be done has been going, I'm told, down to tree by tree level. So looking at urban tree scapes as well. So we should have a lot better data in the next year or two. Um, and another point as well, in terms of the consultation, young people are a big part of the strategy. Um, I wasn't consulted either on this. I think that might have been a mistake. But um, but I'm wondering what was the makeup of the consultation group regarding sort of youth in that, that, that sense? So I think there's more we could have done. We we tried to kind of engage with the universities kind of in and around Somerset, some of the schools. Um, I think part of the way we put the consultation out was kind of the steering group members and the way we did it. Um, so there's lessons we've learned from that. So yeah, I, I, we tried to engage as many people as possible, but I think there's a lot of lessons we've learned from that and there's a lot more we can do. Hence why one of the objectives is around engaging young people and a critical thing we learned in response to that. So yeah, very, very, very important. Um, and uh, to, to do, let's have a look. Um, and I know as well from the strategy, there's a big focus on Taunton. Um, is which, which town has most urban tree cover, and what what's sort of in the strategy about? Well, I mean, I've, I've seen, but but what are we doing more about other towns like Bridgewater, Chard, Yeovil, that kind of thing? Yeah, so there was obviously a mention of Taunton as, as a garden town, but um, I wouldn't be able to tell you which town has got the most tree cover. I'm afraid I'd have to look at the data, but um, we, it's not supposed to be focused specifically on Taunton. You know, we're talking about urban tree scapes in all our towns. We all know the benefits that they bring, and so it should be focused on all urban centres, not not just Taunton. Okie doke. And finally, um, doo -doo -doo, uh, why aren't we? Why aren't there statistics in the um, strategy for hedgerows and roadsides because they've been used and picked up on quite a few times in the strategy as well. So the simple answer is this there's not good data on, on hedgerows. There's a lot of um, the People's Trust for Endangered Species are doing a hedgerow survey at the moment or were going to do a hedgerow survey. But again, that that comes into the, the updated data that the Forestry Commission are doing and will pick up hedgerows because at the moment there's just it's disjointed. There's just not enough data that, that's reliable, unfortunately. Thank you, uh, Mandy, thank you. Thank you uh, very much. So thank you for the strategy. Really great bit of informed reading and I welcome it uh, very much. But we need to be exemplars as a council. We need to set the bar high so that others in the county can follow. So I'm really pleased to see that we're going to be looking to offer sort of help, support and advice around tree planting, etc. But I also notice in the report that there's a comment that they need to negotiate with the council on budget and budget responsibility to fulfil the strategy. So my first question is when and how will those negotiations take place? Because it's absolutely key in putting the strategy out with all these suggestions in it that we can start to deliver some of it. So when will that start to happen? It's my first question. Um, yeah, if I, if I may, as, as I said, the two, there's two project officers that are all re ready to go. I think they're going to be uh, starting at the end of this month uh, and we are still then recruiting for one of those posts. So essentially that work is going to start um, imminently. Thank you. Um, I've had several conversations with um, a very overworked arboriculturalist um, in the county, and I think generally we are short of those those skills. I think it's fair to say. So I welcome that there will be more. Um, if you want to know the most uh, urban trees in any town in Somerset, it's Minehead. Uh, we've got over 500 urban trees, which uh, everybody watches very carefully in the town, and a number of them have been cut down in recent years highway trees are not replaced. Um, so my question is, will we reduce the complexity to enable communities to replant and replace? We've been trying to do that for a couple of years and we've got things like licensing 500 pound charges. There's a lot of hurdles at the moment. So can we have some reassurance that in starting to deliver urban trees and replanting, we will get rid of some of those hurdles and make it an easy process for our communities to follow. That's my second question. Uh, thank you for that. Yes, I think as uh, in response to Councillor Wyke's um, question earlier, um, this is um, very important to make sure that we align with other strategies and policies. And um, I, I would certainly say that we're going to be work, working intently to make sure that happens and um, so that we are, enabled, are able to improve our treescapes in, in urban areas, because we all know the importance of making sure um, that trees in, in that scape are vitally important. 
thank you and I'd love to work with you to get that going in mind head be really welcome to do that make it happen that's what we need to do and just finally the national planning policy framework states that um, we should ensure that new uh, trees are or new streets are tree lined can I just have reassurance that that's actually happening please because I'm might have missed that but I'm sure we've put some streets in that are not tree lined is that something we can actually again enforce within planning as it's a, a, a national planning policy um, Councillor Rigby looks really keen to uh, to respond to that um, Councillor Dyke is it all right if Councillor Rigby replies <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, that's something we're, we're looking into. I'm afraid we, we inherited a long-standing policy of, of not allowing trees on uh, new estate roads because um, the council didn't want to adopt responsibility for them. Uh, and we're in the process of reversing that. So hopefully a tree will be coming to a street near you soon. I look forward to it and we'll hold you to that, Councillor Rigby. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I echo, though, with, uh, with having a substantial new development in my patch the thoughts earlier on uh, developers maintaining the trees that they've put in as well because that's uh, that's often the issue rather than what's on the initial plans um i see online we've got uh, three hands up councillor cavill you've been named so i was going to take you first um, but i don't think it was unkindly named i think it was affectionately <laughs> named my apologies to the others for jumping the queue then in that case um First of all, thank you very much, Dixie and uh, uh, Jacob, for saying that Somerset Wood is going to be included. Uh, it is, as you mentioned, Bill, uh, one of those inherited plans uh, that you have received in the new unit tree, because the county has been very good in backing the 50% of the purchase of all the new trees, and we have excellent buy-in by old and young within the community who have helped us plant them. But my real reason for raising my hand this time was the mention of farmers ploughing up trees. Um, please don't um, duplicate regulations that are already there. There is something called good agricultural and environmental conditions that farmers have to apply with. It's part of DEFRA regulations. If you go to 7C, you'll see that any tree that has a TPO on it is totally uh, protected and you can take proceedings against it via um, those regulations. So the easier way, rather than telling farmers not to plough too close to trees and hedgerows, which they shouldn't be doing anyway, is just to go out and assess the trees that are out in the countryside and those that you want to keep, stick a TPO on them. And there we Thank have Councillor Cavill's hint of the day. Um, I, 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 I think it's, I think that that's that's well taken. Thank you. I, any, I don't see anybody wanting to respond. Thank you very much for your wisdom and advice. Uh, Councillor Kay, um, good, right. good morning. Yes, thank, thank you. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not going to put on my camera because I've got um, internet problems and I don't want to drop out. Um, first of all, I'd like to say that I'm really delighted that this has come forward so fast. And well done, Jacob, because um, we, we were trying to sort of do something a bit similar to this at Mendip and probably some of the other districts as well may well have fed into this. So I'm just really pleased to see it come to fruition. Um, my main concern is about the emphasis on protection of existing trees, um, copses and the linear features like hedgerows. Um, I see that there's sort of occasional references um, to that. And in the film that I wasn't able to um, watch, I'm not sure if it was the same for everybody, it's, it started to say that we were going to, I think it was saying that we were looking to manage our existing trees better. Um, and that would be great um, if that was um, something that we could see in the actions. I had a look at the action plan and I wasn't really sure about whether and how we are going to actually be protecting our existing trees. I understand from the side, the angle of the wood culture, that if we value our trees better, then then we will protect them. Um, but we also have to, it's a bit of carrot and stick really, because we also have to have um, good enforcement action. So for example, where there's illegal tree felling, um, apparently, I think last year, or it might be this year, DEFRA and the Forestry Commission brought in something that would help us um, to um, chase people, own, owners that uh, um, chop trees down illegally. Um, so all the, these three off, new offices that we've got, I, I'm not sure that any of them are going to be working in enforcement, but I would like to see some effort put into enforcement where trees are chopped down illegally. Um, and also in terms of the wood culture, I'm hoping that um, 
I mean, I, I agree with Ros, just, just sort of going off to what Ros said, um, that um, we've got this local plan coming, new local plan, but it's not going to be, um, so my first point is just about enforcement. And so that, that's my first question. I, um, I don't know if you want to take that first, Jacob, or whether I, I'll sh I shall go on to the next thing, which is about planning. Do you want to take that first? Uh, Jacob, do you, you but do the, yeah, do the, happy to say that. So um, around protecting existing trees, um, we've tried to put as much in there as possible. I'll have to have another quick look and see if, see if there's anything else we can reference in there. Um, we are going to be working with planning colleagues. Obviously, the three officers coming in will be working closely with, with departments across. So there will be a need to look at additional enforcement and things like that that will need to sit alongside this. So I absolutely completely agree with that. Um, I know that Helen has sent these questions through to me and myself, so I'm, I'm happy to provide more detail and return responses to her as well. Uh, OK, you, do you want to bring on to your development question then, Helen, please? Yeah, um, yeah, I, basically we, we could wait from three to five years for the next local plan. And um, during that time, there's we several of the dis old districts are subject to predatory developers coming in and they don't have. Well, a lot of them don't have a very good attitude to um, <laughs> to retaining existing trees and hedgerows. We, we've got a big new development behind um, Sainsbury's and McDonald's in Froome where they took out 200 metres of hedgerow and, and it wasn't even mentioned in the, in the planning officer's report. And so I think that, you know, we, we need to. Um, have a, cult, a culture change with our own officers is, is one thing, but also it's like how do we sort of get this moving? Jacobs in, in the um, in the document it makes a reference to SPDs. SPDs, supplementary planning documents, have to peg onto or hook onto the existing local plans, which of which we've got five. But I found out recent, and, and we, we we're not going to be able to do five SPDs, I don't think, just to sort of make sure that developers are aware of, of our views on trees and hedgerows before the next local plan. But I've found out recently about a DPD, a development plan document, which you can do apparently ahead of a new local plan. And um, I'm wondering if we should put our efforts into that instead. So that would be Somerset Y DPD, that is a kind of guidance document for developers and planning our planning officers to use when they're in pre-app talks with developers about um, saving more of our hedgerows and trees. So, um, yeah, I mean, that and that would then weave into the new local plan. So that's just something that I wanted to th throw onto the table to ask to be considered. And uh, last of all, um, I'll just throw this in because I note a lot of people have mentioned about working with farmers as well. I think it's really important. And it's also they sometimes chop down hedgerows within an inch of their lives. And hedgerows are really important as well. And I'm pleased to hear that we've got some other data coming. Jacob saying we've got some other data coming forward about surveying our hedgerows. So I'm quite pleased about that. But if we could consider that DPD idea, I'd be grateful too. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, DPD is, is is a new one on that. I'm Looking forward to the delivery on it. Um, my apologies. Um, did, did, Ros, did I see you indicate? Just to say that I've heard you, Helen, and it has been discussed and will be discussed further. Thank, uh, and Sarah's nodding in, enthusiastically on that. Jacob, anything to add? No, just to say again, I've, I've, I've seen and we'll be working obviously closely with planning colleagues on the local plan, but also what can be done short term. So I completely agree with, with all the points made. Uh, thank you so much for your contribution, Helen, um, and th that was really helpful advice as well. Um, so you learned several things today, this morning, that's pretty good. And, thank uh, you. Tony, good morning, Councillor Locke. How are you? Good morning, Bill. How are you? Um, I, firstly, I'd like to state that I'm supportive of this um, strategy, but I'm also 100% behind um, Councillor Munt and uh, Councillor Boyk and what uh, the angles which they've come from fully support the education in the schools and I think this has got to be on um, incorporated right from the start because there's nothing like getting it installed in ch youngsters from four, three, four, five years upwards and they carry it into their adult life. And uh, so fully supportive of that with the forestry schools has been involved in many schools and um, with those pr projects like that within their uh, bounds. Um, Councillor White mentioned about the planning process. It's very important, the planning process with this, because though it's a very worthwhile strategy, just planting trees, as uh, was stated, uh, we have to be careful not to give anyone the impression that they can just plant a tree 
I mean, I am suffering now at this moment in time in the area where I live, where trees were planted in the 50s and 60s, the wrong types of trees, no consultation, no maintenance. So it's not a five minute job to think we can just plant a tree. And we also have to bear in mind with developers that uh, um, when we talk about urban areas and planting the trees, um, it's very, very difficult with tree planting, though it's nice to see greenery within the trees and in the street scene, but also a consideration, which is a major consideration with those who are doing their refreshes within their urban areas, is the utilities. And half the time, the types of trees you put in, and I know they can be containerized for the roots and everything, it's a very, very difficult and a very long winded process and uh, but fully supportive of it but it's not a five minute job to get the uh, everything together and as councillor white said it has to be incorporated within the planning process and but there are no shortcuts to be had with it thank you thank you tony lots of wisdom and experience uh, based behind those comments and we do appreciate the manual support for this um sarah will you want to take that one yeah, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, Tony, thanks for your comments on that. I, it, it is a long term strategy. And as I said um, in my intro, it will be fluid. We want to make sure that we are able to um, align with other strategies as they come in. Um, but it's it's a case of right tree, right place, Tony. And of course, there's been some uh, mistakes um, in the past with, with planting. Um, we need to make sure that we get this right. It's absolutely crucial that um, um, we just simply get the tree, the trees in the right place but also managed correctly going forward as well. And that is the work that our technical officer um, and also our community empowerment officer and our project officers will be doing to ensure that we get this right and delivery is as focused and uh, successful as possible. Uh, if I could just if I yeah, could just come back briefly, Tony, Bill. Yes, briefly. Um, bri yeah, I thank you for that, Sarah. But I mean, this is where the planning process comes in with moving forward with the maintenance and everything else. And this is where it has to be tied up completely and 100 percent because it is just not happening at this moment in time. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think your point is well made and taken. And I think Helen's uh, suggestion of, a, of looking into a DPD is uh, is well made. And I think that may well provide a, an avenue forward for us to explore. Um, Councillor Osborne, and Sue so again. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, just to what I hope are quick questions. Um, my first one is, you talked earlier about Sarah's DPD proposal, and it sounded as though you're already working on that. Um, will there be member input into that? And will a draft version be coming to scrutiny so members can have a proper look at it and feed in? That's my first question. My second one is, I may have missed this because I had to leave the room, apologies. But we do, but Somerset Council is still a substantial landowner. It has quite a significant land holding. Um, how do you propose to utilise or take opportunities with that land holding? to set your to lead by example and show what can be done and potentially um, take some opportunities to support community led tree planting forest school community projects based on woodland if i may sarah um two two things on that first of all um as with um, local plans, SPDs, DPDs and other amendments, these are, are subject to a statutory public consultation process. And so, yes, members will have an opportunity to contribute. Um, in terms of using our land, yes, um, I think that that is something. It has to be done just like the, the right tree in the right place and that, and that same for land use. I can cite an example of some land which is in discussion with a community to the um, east of the county where the parish council have sought um, to um, have some land to plant a community orchard and put various other things into it in terms of amenities. 
for the community and we're actively working with them to see whether it's appropriate and I'm very optimistic that the community will have um, a new appropriate wooded area within the within their um, community. Okay, thank you for picking thank you. that one up and uh, Councillor Dingwall, Andy, good morning. Good morning, Chair. Thank you very much. Very brief, I promise. Uh, three uh, quite tactical questions, if that's OK. Um, the first I read, um, uh, I have read very briefly the tree supply report on gov.uk, um, which states that the nurseries are very short on supply of um, particularly seeds uh, in order to grow um, grow new trees. So the three questions. Uh, firstly, is there a risk of supply meaning a lack of supply, meaning we won't be able to hit the targets in the strategy. Uh, the second part of it is with the dynamics of supply and demand, is there a risk that we may be priced out of purchasing um, trees as other councils also have their strategies to, to fulfil? And the third is, is there any opportunity for Somerset to develop its own nurseries um, in order to meet our, uh, meet our supply, meet our strategy? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, all really good questions. Um, so in terms of tree supply, um, as long as we're smart in terms of planning, so a lot of people kind of don't put tree orders until September, October, that's when you tend to run out of trees or you get the wrong trees because they're not available. So um, yes, in terms of planning, so as long as we plan and what we're doing in advance, we should be fine. I wouldn't be able to comment on price of trees. Obviously, that depends on the market, but we all know that more people are, are wanting more trees. We are seeing the, the supply increase. Um, and that kind of goes on to the, your third question. So we're aware of community uh, tree nurseries. There's one um, in the Mendip area, which we worked very closer with over the last couple of years. And there are others. I think we've got one that was formerly South Somerset and formerly Somerset Western Taunton. So we have got our own that we're producing. And I think that's important that we, we get seeds and stock from Somerset. So we try and keep the kind of the diversity and the genetic kind of adaptation side as well for trees of Somerset. So yeah, absolutely. So that's no, something we're very aware of. But yeah, very good question. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you, Councillor Dingwood. Did you want to come back and briefly on that one, Ros? Yeah, I will do um, a name check. The um, the nursery um, in Mendip area is at Westbury Sub Mendip, my own community, and we have a, a um, tree nursery now which is four years old and has produced thousands and thousands of trees. It has a good biosecurity system and we're going to make sure that the ash disease which was imported from abroad, um, we're going to make sure that in our part of the world there will be no trees imported and planted locally. They will all be grown from seed locally. And I would I would commend that process to any other community. It's not just about um, planting trees, it's growing your own. And I really do think that emphasis should be increased. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm not seeing any other contribution. Um, again, I can't see a scrutiny chair online, but it was given a very thorough airing at scrutiny. I'm led to believe on the scrutiny chairs on a group holiday somewhere. Or, or no, no, Castle Redmond's in the room, so either he's not invited or, 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 or maybe they're on a day out. I don't know. Anyway. Um, well, we've had a, had a had a thorough airing of that of this strategy. Um, I, I know we've, we've gone into it in some depth, and it's it, when you go into something in in depth, it feels like you're being a little bit negative about it. And I think the whole tone has been: this is an amazing strategy. How can we make it even better? Um, it is so important that we that we achieve our aspirations for for our tree canopy in Somerset, um, not least because of our climate change objectives, but also it has so so much wider um, in, in importance in order of people's well-being as well in our community. So I do I do hope that you don't take any negativity from the questioning. It is it, it is um, very much about a, 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 a love of a love of nature. And some of the questioning I was just I felt like a scrutiny meeting at one at one point that we were going into so much detail, which is which, which is lovely um, and that people are so passionate about. Um, we have recommendations. So, um, I'll, 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 are there any amendments we want to see to those recommendations, or do I see a proposer, Councillor Dyke to propose, Councillor Munt to second? Can I see those in favour and those against? That's clearly carried. Thank you. I'm really excited about the adoption of that strategy and look forward to the delivery 
Uh, Jacob, thank you so much for all your work on that. And it, it, it was one of those papers that was a real, a real pleasure to read it rather than, and I'm sorry, that sounds, I was about to, <laughs> I was about to denigrate other papers. Um, but uh, it was, it was, it was fascinating. Um, and uh, as, as all our papers are, but especially, especially a page turner, um, virtually, of course, because it's not on paper. Um, uh, the early career strategy. Uh, Theo, welcome to your new role, Theo. And, uh, and uh, it's this for you to introduce. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I note from your schedule that you want to wrap up the meeting by 11.26. If being 11.29, I'll be brief. Uh, <laughs> I'm delighted at this early stage in my career to be able to present the early careers strategy. Um, this is a really exciting and important uh, document. It covers, um, it seeks to address two uh, issues in particular. One is the sustainability of our workforce, our ageing workforce, trying to make sure that we have that, that talent and skill at the lower age range, which I know there's been work on uh, in the past and is, is ongoing. Uh, and it, it also, by doing that, helps to address um, the issue. We have the wider demographic issue that we have here in Somerset of uh, needing to uh, attract young people to Somerset, keep young people in Somerset, and bring young people back to Somerset by providing those career opportunities for them, particularly within Somerset Council, but potentially working with our partners um, beyond. Uh, this document does that uh, by addressing a number of issues. Uh, it looks at uh, how we get um, yeah, care leavers into employment, how we get uh, people with uh, SAND into employment, how we um, treat our graduates and how we recruit interns uh, and, uh, and uh, apprentices. Uh, so there's lots of really good stuff in here and I'm sure uh, over the next year we will be developing it and uh, making it even better and delivering on it. And I look forward to reporting on it in a year if given the opportunity. Um, but as I've alluded to, it is a very early stage in my career on this executive. Um, I am not here to take the credit for this work. I'm here to take the blame. The person who's here to take the credit is uh, Misha Vidyat, who is our early careers lead. And I think it's my job to introduce her. She was sitting behind me. She's now sitting over there. Uh, do, do. She, she has entered stage left and it's no longer behind you. Um, good morning, Misha. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Mike. I've just got a few slides to, to take uh, you all through this morning um, so we can move on to the first slide. Thank you. <clears throat> so our ask today is uh, for endorsement for the early career strategy. Um, I'm sure I've spoken to many of you about the work that we do under that strategy before, um, but we're asking for your endorsement today and agreement um, for our annual updates. Uh, to keep you abreast of what is going on under the early career strategy. Next slide, please, Mike. So just a really quick overview of how we've got to where we are today. Um, we have very much built upon the work of the five previous organisations. We're looking to take the best of what was going on across the county and district councils and bring it together to move forward as, as a unitary council. So we've taken the best of what's going on. In the development of the early career strategy, there was that cross organisation representation um, and we made sure it was uh, cascaded out to all partners, both young people, partner organisations that we work with, uh, unions and education providers. Next slide, please. Fundamentally, the offer at the heart of the early career strategy is uh, these four initiatives here, uh, looking at ways to bring young people into the workforce through education and employment together. So we've got apprenticeships there that range now from level two right up to master's level seven. And we do make use of the wide variety of those levels within the council already, both through bringing young people into the workforce, but also upskilling our current staff as well. Work, <coughs> excuse me, work experience and T levels. Uh, again, a way to engage with, with young people um, when they're early in their studies, bringing them into the workplace, showcasing what we can do. Um, and then making those connections with them early on to hopefully bring them back at a later stage in their education to begin working with us. We've got a graduate scheme uh, that's in its third cohort now this year. Um, you can see there it's a, a paid progression scheme, uh, a very competitive salary, 
um, and we rotate them around a service and that we have them as a peer group. They've been really successful and we're looking forward to the third cohort this year. And then finally, you've got internships there at the bottom. Uh, predominantly, uh, we utilise them for A-level or uh, graduates who just want a taste of the workplace. But what we're looking to do this year is extend our offer to our SEND young people and <clears throat> begin working with the national project search uh, provider to offer SEND internships across the council. <clears throat> and just there on the right, you can see uh, some statistics for what we've been up to under the early career strategy in terms of apprenticeships since 2020. <clears throat> Next slide, please. What we're looking to do is uh, maximise on opportunities uh, and, like I say, of what the best of the best from what was going on pre-vesting day. We've launched a young employees network, um, which is uh, for the uh, workforce of ages 16 to 26 across the council. And we're looking at how we can support them to have a voice within the organisation, but also develop them through their careers, uh, both professionally and personally. We've got the pathway to employment budget, which is a specific pot of money to support our most vulnerable or disadvantaged young people, focusing on care leavers and those with SEND. We bring care leavers into the organisation on a yearly basis, uh, funded via this budget uh, through apprenticeships, um, and we do the same with our SEND young people. Outside of that budget, we are also working with various service areas across the council to support these young people as well. But we do have a specific pot of money that we can support uh, on salaries and helping them access the world of education and work. We're looking to support as many SMEs as we can across the county. Um, for those that, that don't know, with your apprenticeship levy, you can transfer up to 25% of it to small organisations to help them recruit apprentices into their workforce. Um, we've been doing this since 2020, and so far we've committed just over £1 million in support of smaller organisations across the county. We try to keep the money in Somerset where we can, but we have supported organisations in neighbouring counties uh, when they, they aren't able to get that funding elsewhere. And we want to continue to showcase the work going on within Somerset Council uh, via regional national awards, uh, both for ourselves as an organisation, but also for our apprentices as well. Uh, and the final slide, please, Mike. And just to touch upon what we'd like to do over the next 12 months, what we're working on uh, now and that we'd like to come back to you with updates on. So we are launching our third uh, cohort of the graduate scheme. Uh, the previous two cohorts, uh, were, they were just county council based and they were looking at uh, cohorts of seven. Uh, this year, we have obviously, uh, after vesting day, we're now a unitary council and we're looking at up to 28 roles, which is a really fantastic uh, start to the unitary council in terms of the graduate scheme. We're really excited about that. I touched upon it earlier, but we are looking at further supported employment initiatives such as Project Search, reintroducing our supported apprenticeships and looking at uh, supported work experience as well. We're looking at launching large scale apprenticeship programmes that we haven't uh, touched upon before, such as the Transport Driver Level 2, to try and balance the age of the workforce in those sectors. And we want to continue to work with the government colleagues to stay ahead of the curve and maintain our status as a go-to council within the southwest region. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Misha. Are there any comments from colleagues on executive? Oh, uh, yeah, go on to the guy from first, please. And if I may, uh, Chair, it's not a question. It's my word. Um, I just wanted to say, as former lead member for HR, um, I wish my colleague, Councillor Buck Phillip, well. Um, and I know that Councillor Keach will join me in this in saying it's a wonderful team of people working on behalf of all the people of this council. Uh, and they have achieved this work at the same time as the massive recruitment process for tiers one to three. 
They've also completed the dynamic working strategy and all of the most commonly used policies that had to be aligned across the five councils. Um, so there's been a tremendous amount of work done. And I, I can say to Misha that one of my greatest pleasures and a close friend is somebody who came uh, to work in the organisation I headed up as a graduate trainee. And I realised within two weeks I would never keep up with her. And I never have. Um, and that is one of the great pleasures of, of work, is actually seeing other people gain their wings and fly very quickly in your organisation. But I also need to give a word of warning to Councillor Butfillet that the point at which you think you've finished really significant learning is now, in my experience, the time at which you start. <laughs> and so be aware that actually the workplace it starts early, but it never ends in my experience. And that is a great pleasure too. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Liz. Uh, Tessa. Thank you. I just wanted to make the observation. Thank you. It's a good document. It's and I, I applaud what's happening. But I would just make the observation that taking work experience students in year 10 is too late. It's too late because actually our children and young people mostly are asked to make decisions about their options in year nine. So they should be thinking in, they should be getting information and experience of something in year seven and eight, as far as I can see. And I, I'm sure that David Clark will tell me that it's all around insurance and God knows what else. But actually, I think we need to make some bold changes and find a way to make sure that younger people can come and do some sort of work experience, not just in our council, but in other parts of, of uh, the work across Somerset. But it's, you know, it's absolutely pointless. Well, it's not absolutely pointless, but it's, it's less effective to come and find some experience when you've already decided to do subjects that might not necessarily suit initially what it is that we're searching for. Thank you. Thank, uh, thanks. Your point. Your point is well made. I spent two years in my career doing um, coordinating work experience, and I, I, I came to the conclusion that what we, what that a lot, large part of what was traditionally done, was at uh, uh, best pointless and at worst counterproductive. Um, and I think there is a whole point, piece of work to do around that area. Um, I'm not sure it's this document per se um, in terms of that, but I, do, I, I think the point is well made. There is some really good um, work going on in our schools around STEM. Um, that, that, that is, is very valuable and, and, and I, I look forward to that coming to, to us understanding a little bit more about how we can work with our education partners to deliver that. Briefly back, Tessa. Yeah, just very briefly. I, what I don't want to do is decry the experience that can be gained in this council because there is a huge variety of careers that might come out of working from the council. So I, I'm not decrying the strategy at all, but I do think we need to find a way to reverse into younger age groups. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 move forward. I've, I've had conversations certainly with, with college providers about the ability to be able to do work experience placements in areas like people considering social work. And we, we kind of like our like our, our, our local aspiring graduates to, to consider social work as a profession for some fairly obvious reasons. Um, but uh, I think we're starting to starting to digress. Uh, am I seeing anything else uh, around from executive lead members or associate lead members? So looking around the room, I can see a hand, but not a face. It's Captain Perbrick. Hello, Faye. Me? Oh, sorry. So, sorry, Dave, I missed you online. I'll come back to you in a moment, if that's OK. OK, yeah, that's fine. Thank you, Chair. And I find myself in violent agreement with many people sat around this table, which is, is really nice, I think, when we're talking about um, the strategy for, for people working in this council. Um, I've got a couple of I've got a couple of points um, just around um, the, the the strategy and the approach, and then just a couple um, um, things to point out. So I'm, I'm really glad to see this come back. It's something that was introduced in 2017 and has grown. And I'd like to offer congratulations to all of the HR team. And I know we've got five councils that have come together. This is a continuing authority, and I'm afraid I only know about the strategy that's happened in the county council. I'm sure there are wonderful ones everywhere else. So not belittling that, but bringing this forward, the growth in the um, 
the number of apprentices and the breadth of apprentices within this organization has been fantastic and i think it's a, a great thing that you're doing in 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 building this forward i do have a slight concern about the word early career strategy um, and I, I don't know, and I welcome Councillor Buttflip to, to his position. I don't know how old he is and I won't ask. But as he as he mentioned, he's in his early career um, in the role that he's doing now. And I think we need to recognise across the county and across the wider country, there's a lot of people who will have multiple careers. We've got a, a massive number of people leaving the armed forces who may be over the 29 mark, who are looking at new, strat at new careers and they will be looking to retrain with government funding that's been announced around re-apprenticeships and things like that, I think potentially this is our young people's career strategy and the early career strategy could actually be at 30, at 40, at 50. We're going to all be working for longer. And I think we need to make sure we're capturing the ability. And we know during COVID, a lot of people changed what they were doing. People you know, within our council who were working in highways and places like that found that they enjoyed care work or stuff that they did with public health. And we need to find a way to capture and encourage that. So I would just ask you to expand upon the, the view of early careers. Um, my other ask is that potentially some tweaking and wording we talk about care leavers and those with uh, with with send and additional needs but actually we've got care experienced young people they might not have left care at the point where they become a young person rather than a child but they may still need some additional support from their experience of care and i think everything that we do when we're talking about care leavers needs to think about care experienced young people as well because we do see um, extra help needed there um and yeah I, I think that, that those are my main asks really that that we develop in terms of questions there's a just just a few things around the equalities assessment i think there's a a, a couple of um of things that are, are, are typos or mispastes and things like that where we talk about pregnancy in the religion and non-relief box and it is both good and bad um so I, I think we, if we could just tweak that before the, um, the the stuff goes online as a decision made. Um, and we've also got nothing about rurality in this. And while the, the measures that you're taking to address the equalities impacts um, are, are very good, I think the rurality bit and actually the story you've got with, with some of the, the transport issues, the new potential young people's bus pass and that, um, you've got... The ability to address the fact there is a rurality issue whereas it's not mentioned anywhere um, in that box and also what the um the subsequent actions could be to to address that so could we look at a young people strategy and my my i suppose my question um is also could we see what the the program of strategies is that is going to make up our workforce we had a workforce strategy many years ago i presume that's coming but it'd be really helpful to see as councillor white was saying earlier you know, we've got these strategies how do they fit together so maybe a, a forward plan of strategies thank you uh, thank you for your feedback on on those um first of all i think you said violent agreement at the start um vehement agreement would be welcome of violence i would hope was was not something we were going to experience that that was that was okay um and i think there are a number of points to to, to respond to i think councillor wyke's already already um oh, i've got a hand up so ross thank you thank you I do recognise this is an internal document and I welcome it and I do do recognise also some of the comments about broadening it and getting it right. I do, however, um, going back and standing back and thinking more strategically, I think this needs to be aligned with our general skills agenda across the county because while we're doing something and we can be an exemplar employer, actually this is right across the whole patch, how we actually lift people's expectations and opportunities to um, get training. And then that really does take into play the, the issue about rurality and transport and the skills agenda broader. So while I recognise this document and it's good, I think we just need to, both as a county, when we're doing things internally, actually perhaps look across our own organisation and look at other agendas and other um, uh, initiatives being developed and one of them is with our partners and the wider skills agenda and so welcome this but please can we align this work with other work which is going on within the, the county-wide skills agenda 
Uh, Councillor Perrick, were you, were you wanting to just respond briefly? Just, just really to come back, because I, I absolutely agree, and I, a, a moment to, to really big up the um, Somerset Education Partnership. It's something, business, Education Business Partnership, it's something that many counties would love to have, um, and also actually offers the opportunity through Dr Julie Young um, to do some of the stuff that Councillor Mont was saying about catching children early through the Education Partnership with our FE colleges. It started at 16 to 19. They're bringing those um, programmes back to 14 to get young people into the organisation organizations and that does work across the whole county and I think you've got an exemplar of how things can work there um, please make sure that you use them thank you um, any other comments on that I'll bring in Councillor Wohn next if I may good morning Dave morning Bill uh, just going back to uh, Tessa's point on bringing uh, work experience down to years seven and eight uh, I couldn't agree more with that. Uh, it's critical that uh, that children are exposed to the outside world to inspire them and aspire them to to take on careers. And I know there's evidence already that Leonardo helicopters in in Yeovil have been uh, into some of the primary schools making paper aeroplanes to um, to inspire the children on the principles of flight in a very low key way. Um, and I, th there is also evidence out there that the uh, children, when children come out of education and go for their first interview, there are some children out there, this is their first experience of face to face with an adult outside their own family. And I, frankly, I find that shocking. I mean, I, I was I was one of those. I, I'd never you know, when I went for my first job interview. I was the first contact I'd had with with an adult and the the issues of skills and getting trained staff in is a common issue when I'm out on the road speaking with and listening to uh, employers and education facilities such as our colleges and we need to get our employers into schools in greater numbers again for the reasons I said uh, that Leonardo have been doing to inspire our children to aspire and if there's one thing I, I do before I come up for the, the next set of elections, I want to turn Somerset, if we can, into a net importer of young people. We've got to make it a hub for excellence in that respect. Thank you. I think we, we will all, all echo those thoughts. Um, certainly, I've, I've organised that programme of um, mock job interviews for uh, students in year 10 as part of a work, work experience programme, and it is making sure that businesses and the public sector uh, are happy to release staff for a day in order to, to undertake that sort of exercise. And I'd hope we'd support that as an employer, as well as encouraging partners to do that. Yeah. Um, I've got Councillor Nicholson next. Hello, Francis. I have to say has been um, largely shortened because uh, much of my thunder has already been stolen. Um, but yes, um, also very much supportive and in, in, in agreement and only saying things that are in, I hope, will help and add. Um, just to, I, I, and I know it's an internal document still at the moment, uh, something about not stereotyping. Um, first of all, I, I would always prefer to use the term care experienced rather than care lever at all points, but that's that's just a matter of drafting. Um, the we should not with well, the only mention of care levers is for the pathways to independence uh, to, to to employment, which is absolutely all about getting young people to a point where they might be employable, who are often a very long way from that, from the experiences that they've had. Now, I'm not I'm I, I, all. All children who have experienced care have had damaging things happened in their lives or that wouldn't have happened, but some of them are very high achieving. Let's not think of them as only oh pathways to employment that that really, really worries me. The same thing goes for send. There are people with send who are very high achieving and our young people's champions who are just stunning people. One I remember from the past then went straight off from her year here being our young people's champion to medical school as a, as, as a student. Um, let, let's just make sure that we're thinking in those terms as as, as well. Um, 
and the, the the other bit this is this is perhaps um a a, a, a bit more a, a slightly more technically about the 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 impact assessment now i i thought an impact assessment and i seek advice if the the, the way we do it has changed uh, was to look at the potential negative impacts of a decision um, and then what the mitigation should be. This one appears to be listing all the things that might be difficult that this is this is this um, this strategy is intended to address. So it, it felt a little odd to see all these negative impacts of the of the strategy. Uh, maybe we're doing them differently now, but that's just perhaps something to just to be looked at. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for those those comments. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming they're taken on board. Um, was there anything I didn't detect anything you were looking particularly for a response? Yeah, I want a response or, on not stereotyping uh, 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 people. Oh, oh I'm, I'm absolutely. I think there was a, just be an absolutely yes. Um, there, in no way would we stereotype um, uh, those those children who but are experienced in any in any way, consciously or unconsciously. And uh, I think that's something we would we, we we take that point fully on board. Um, if that's uh, if that's an acceptable response to you. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, Lee Redmond, councillor. Thank you, Chair. Uh, some of my thunder has been dampened as well, but who cares? We're going for it anyway. Um, it needs to be said uh, this document is an amazing document. I think it, it, it does and says some fantastic things. So. I wanted to get that over with first. Um, I align myself with the comments of the previous speakers in relation to terminology and stuff. So one of my questions was going to be around uh, uh, the previous motion that's passed with full council in relation to care experience, whether uh, it's been applied to this document. Uh, I was going to speak to Mr Clark after the meeting to, to address how our impact assessments are laid out and whether there is already work in place to bring them a little bit further up to date because as has been mentioned previously uh, not necessarily this document specifically but there seems to be a bit of uh, I'm used to the current process would you just pick that up and put that there that ticks that box when it comes to some of our uh, 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 assessments that are be impact assessments that are being made however we're, we've got a new kid on the block for that one and hopefully what we'll do is be able to find a way to, to to bring that in and make it a little bit newer the new kid on the block david is don't worry it's not you it's my motion that was passed the care experience bit um i just uh, to see if we can make this better the, the point has been made about the children looked after and the fact that they could be a little bit more complex in some way to get going in, to get into employment so a couple of points and questions really um there's already a uh, uh, under the corporate parent board uh, a, a subgroup which is care leavers subgroup and i wondered whether there was an opportunity to link some of this document into them with the view to being able to hopefully learn from other ex experiences it's been made reference about the southwest and the fact that we've got lots of opportunities there so and i think the, the indication is that we're already reaching out to get learn best, best practice from them the one i was going to use was obviously hinkley c with the, 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 the Young People Academy that they've got there and the work that they've done, obviously with the potential fingers crossed, arms crossed and everything else crossed with gravity, that could obviously build for that. Because one of the things that we lack in this county is an ability to hold our young people. Too often they are, they go off to be educated somewhere else and then they don't come back until they retire. What we need to do is find a link to give, and this document adds, will add another layer to that, another opportunity. Um, the bit that, that, that I think might be, is, is how will we know we're succeeding? Sometimes it might be useful to put targets on it. I see that there's an annual report coming back. But why do if we if we have is it, is, is it annually enough? Can we find a way to bring it more soon to a different place? Or is there an ability to put some targets against it? Are, are there targets or KPIs attached to this? this document? If not, can we add them? Because there's always the opportunity. If you've got a target to aim for, then when it's reported back, you can make it better the next time if it's if you succeed. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you. Do we have a response on those points, particularly about KPI? I think that would be a really interesting one if we can can come up with something on for the annual report that is a measure of success. I'm always yeah. Um, yeah, I think one of the joys about reading an annual report like this is we'll probably see 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 um, exemplars of what is really good about what we do, but also seeing the whole picture would be really, really great to see that. Okay. 
And I, I think the, the the other point about the um, care experience, I think we'll pick up. You're, you, you're hoping to pick up with. Well, you're the new kid on the block, or he, he's the new kid on the block. I lost track of that metaphor. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll pick up outside. Is that that's okay? Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm not seeing any other comments or questions on this. So may I have a proposal for the recommendations to endorse this strategy and to receive so it's proposed by Councillor but Philip seconded by Councillor Smith Roberts and those in favour please and those against that's clearly carried. Okay um, we have our item eight the executive forward plan which is published on the council website. Is there any comment or questioning on this Councillor Lysham? Um, thank you at the prompting uh, by Councillor Heather Shearer, who never misses a detail. Um, I've been in touch with Michelle Brooks and between us, um, and particularly led by Michelle, we're looking through all the detail on these decisions to make sure the lead members are correct. Uh, and some where decisions have, have perhaps already been made by officers that, that they come off the forward plan. So we are aware that there's some work outstanding to make sure this is as accurate as it clearly needs to be. Thank you. OK, I think uh, I think there's a couple of pieces of work to take place offline just to double check. We've got accuracy on a number of points there, but I'm happy with that. This, um, if there's no further comments, um, I would just request to note this, which I think we will have. OK, thank you so much. And we're ending the meeting at 12 o'clock, which is 34 minutes ahead of schedule. And we spent behind um, behind schedule. Um, we went into into the tree strategy, root and branch. Oh. Is it now time to leave?